This is Trevor Karitson coming at you for a special insulin exposed edition. So one thing I've been getting all of my clients to do is test their fasting blood glucose numbers. It's very, very simple to do. You basically would have a fasting blood glucose monitor like this. They're not expensive. I mean, most of these glucose monitors you actually get for free if you buy the strips. One thing that is becoming extremely alarming is the amount of bodybuilders who had a healthy body fat. I'm talking 6%, 7%, 8%. The last people you think would have type 2 diabetes are coming back with super high fasting blood glucose numbers. There's a lot of reasons for that. There's you know, stimulant usage, stress, lack of sleep, overabundance of carbs in the diet. Anyways, I'm not the expert on that. So I brought back on the show IFBB Pro Colette Nelson because she's the expert when it comes to insulin. So Colette, the first thing I want to know is should everyone be testing their fasted blood glucose at least like maybe once per week? The answer to that question by many medical professionals would be like, well, if you don't have a predisposition, if you're not over 45, if you're not overweight, if you exercise every day, well, then why would you bother? And, and my concern is that exactly what you said. So I will say yes. And I think it's become almost epidemic proportions. By 2050, one in three people are going to have type 2 diabetes. One in three. So my concern is exactly what you said. So when everybody thinks about type two diabetes, and this is your standard medical professional, that's what they're looking at. They're looking at for different classifications. They're looking at age, they're looking at your lifestyle, they're looking at your BMI, they're looking at your diet, um, and they're, they're looking at behavior, like do you sleep, you know, are you overweight? And so then the doctor, oh, you know, let's, let's take a closer look. You, you, you might be predisposed to type two diabetes. But I think what's concerning to me and to you and to, you know, people in our industry is that we're just taking for granted, you know, we're, we're, we're taking for granted our health a lot of times in this industry. We think we're indispensable. But the problem is that it's something that we really do need to look at and knowing the numbers, and we're going to go through that today, is really important because when you get a fasting blood sugar test on, you know, at your doctor's office, if you come in at 100, they, they dismiss it. You know, they're like, ah, you know, don't worry about it. something you ate. And I, believe me, I've seen this because I've worked with people where that was, their, that was their dismissal, you know. The truth of the matter is somebody that's an athlete that works out the way we do, their fasting sugar should be below 90. Please, everybody listen to me. That is the truth. Really, fasting sugars are ideal at 75 to 85. So I'm saying when the, the blood sugar is 100, is that bad? No, not really, right? But to a doctor, that's like nothing. Forget it. Don't worry about it. It was something you ate the night before. You know, you, you're stressed out, you know. But, but I want you to be concerned because every day that your blood sugars are between 100 and 126, every day that that happens, your beta cell is working harder. Okay, so let's talk about the beta cell. The beta cell makes insulin. That is in the pancreas. That is a very important cell. And I want to clarify that people often, this happened to me today at the gym when I was talking about insulin. They're like, oh, I would never take insulin, you know. Uh, it's going to cause diabetes, you know. And, and I'm like, I, I really hate to tell you this. That is not true. It's not like a feedback hormone like that. It's, it doesn't work like that, like testosterone and the pituitary and it's sending all these different messages and it's lowering your levels because you're putting in exogenous testosterone and then you run the risk of these other things happening. This cell, this beta cell, it's a workhorse, all right? This is a working cell. It's working to regulate your blood sugar. It's working very hard. So I want this to be very clear. This cell is working every single day. It never gets a day off this cell. Why are we seeing such an influx of type two diabetes and now type three diabetes in the brain where glucose is going to the brain and causing this Alzheimer's? So my theory is this is a workhorse cell that eventually is burning out. And I think, now remember, I'm theorizing this. I'm a diabetes educator. I work in endocrinology and um, aspirations of one day finishing my nurse practitioner. Um, so that I'll be able to actually be a provider. But what I'm saying is that eventually this cell is working less and less and less as we get older. It's just a theory of aging, my theory of aging. The, the worst thing you can have in your body is blood glucose. It's like acid going through your, your, all your vessels, destroying you slowly but surely, slowly but surely. So all this sugar that's accumulating over time, and it might be so, it seems so limited, like, ah, my blood sugar fasting is 110, 115. You know, this is a problem because that cell is now burning out, slowly but surely burning out. So I can tell you, let's restrict your diet. Let's reduce your carbohydrates. You've got to, everybody has in this adrenal fatigue. Hello, people out there that I used to be this way. 
you're working out for three hours. You're not eating enough. You're starving. You're in a stress fight or flight every second of the day. You guys, that causes insulin resistance. It does. And insulin resistance is making the beta cell, the cell that makes the insulin, work harder. Hear what I'm saying. You're driving this car and you're running out of gas. Now imagine this. If you give insulin earlier, and there's a theorist, and I, and I want to read you some of this theory so I won't remember all of what he says, 30 reasons why you should take insulin <laughs> if you start noticing your fasting sugar is starting to elevate, okay, is that you're preserving the beta cell. You're doing the exact opposite. In fact, there are theorists in Europe right now that believe by giving insulin earlier, you can prevent diabetes from ever happening. Okay, so, so, so call, that, it, call it, call it, call it. Before, before we jump into insulin, all the different types of insulins, who should take insulin? Right. I want to know why is this happening? So this is a perfect example. I had a new client sign up last week, young 30 year old guy, top level national bodybuilder. I mean, very low body fat, lots of muscle, exercising regularly, good diet. I told him, you know, in the, in the initial questionnaire, please test your fasted blood glucose. And he basically emailed me back. He's like, dude, why should I spend a hundred bucks on strips when right. you know, I'm a low body fat? I have none of the telltale signs of type two diabetes. And I basically said, just hear me out, man. Like, like buy it. The strips are going to last forever. You're going to use it eventually. Just, just trust me. It's a really good thing to keep an eye on. He tested his fasted blood glucose. It was 130. Wow. I was so surprised. I was so surprised. I was like, something has to be up, man. Did you yeah. maybe like sleepwalk and, and like, eat some rice in the middle of the night. I was like, do it again to, for me the next day. The next day was 127. So I want to know why are these, you know, people who are, are they're, they're not what you think a type two diabetic would be. Like when you think type two diabetes, you think overweight, oh, yeah. shit. why are these healthy bodybuilders, you know, who are muscular, exercising regularly, not eating fast food or anything like that. Why are they coming back with such bad fasted blood glucose levels and such bad insulin resistance? And this is something that I think everybody watching this series is going to take a step back. They're going to take a step back because I can promise you, when I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes in 1984, which we didn't know what we know now about the repercussions of blood glucose. So we just thought the type 1s were doomed. They could never get their sugars under control. So they told me my life expectancy was 65 because of blood glucose. They, they feared that I would never be able to achieve an A1C. And we'll talk about that. And there'll be something up on the screen that will explain what an A1C is ever normal because back then we had such limited resources, right? So they knew, think about that, it's average life expectancy. So now I want everybody listening to this to understand Trevor that you're right on track. We need to get these people testing their fasting sugar because our behavior as top athletes actually can predispose us to this type of insulin resistance much you know, more it's unusual because it's not presenting in the way. Diabetes is going to have five different classifications. They're working on changing this because the medical professionals are starting to get aware. There isn't just type one, there's not just type one and a half, and there's not just type two. There's different phases of these, these confounds of type one, type two, type one and a half. There's just different elements of them that, that make what's going on in their body either more harmful, more difficult to control, or what I'm finding is this something else. Okay, what is the cause? So here's what we know. I'm, I'm going to just make it very clear that insulin resistant hormones in the body, okay, will cause insulin resistance. So I have treated patients. Uh, I used to actually work in an HIV clinic and I'm like, why am I working in an HIV clinic? First, it wasn't even up my alley. I was, you know, if I did diabetes forever. It's because the drugs were causing secondary diabetes. Cystic fibrosis, there's a secondary diabetes to the drugs because it causes this insulin resistance and eventually the insulin cannot get through the cells. The insulin has to get through the cells and if they're blocked, then basically all you're gonna do is keep overproducing insulin until the beta cell fails. So why is that happening? You guys, it's going to happen if you're predisposing your, your body to this fight or flight, this over adrenal fatigue, you're constantly in a state of stress, fight or flight. I mean, we're talking from ephedra to caffeine to clenbuterol to the mass of stimulants and I mean mass. I can't tell you a single bodybuilder, except for me probably, uh, that doesn't take a pre-workout. You know, I don't do ever pre-workouts. I, I don't recommend them. Like everybody hates me. Like, what pre-workout are you doing? Nothing. I'm doing apple cider vinegar, lemon, uh, um, calm. I take calm in the morning. You know what I mean? Because I want to reduce another my cholesterol. Thing, another thing, call it, is that these pre-workouts, a lot of them are containing 300 to 400 milligrams of caffeine per, per scoop, right? 
yep. an eight ounce cup of coffee has roughly 85 grams of caffeine. So that's the equivalent of drinking five cups of coffee in a single scoop. And a lot of people are double scooping it. Yeah. But if, like, if you would tell that person, would you drink 10 cups of coffee for breakfast? They'd be like, no, of course not. That'd be horrible right. for my health. You're basically doing that before every single workout. Yeah, I mean, that's what, I mean, you're, we're saying it, people are listening. So the average people in our world, okay, they're doing that. They're over, I mean, believe me, I've seen worse. I mean, there's I, people snorting their, their pre-workout, right? I mean, it's like, it's whatever they can do to stay stimulated. They're drinking coffee all day long. They're not sleeping, okay, especially when you're getting ready for a competition. You're actually in the worst state of health when you're getting ready for competition. So you're not sleeping. Um, you're not eating. Your body is under a constant state of stress. Then you topple on top of that. You take counter-regulatory hormones to insulin like growth hormone. Sorry, that one is a counter-regulatory. Can, anybody can look that up. It is anti-insulin hormone. Your insulin has to work harder. So people will tell me, I get low blood sugar on growth hormone. Well, what's happening is your body's overproducing insulin working harder that is that poor little beta cell again that's just ready to you know just die on you uh, you're taking years off your beta cell and so now you're doing that then god forbid you have an injury now you're getting a cortisone shot or you're taking prednisone or you're doing whatever you need to do to get rid of the pain so you've just toppled yourself into a situation where it's almost like a drug or state induced type 2 diabetes and i've treated so many patients like that uh that were on long-term prednisone they didn't have diabetes. There's nothing wrong with these people. Um, they were on prednisone for a period of time, and their beta cells started failing. I mean, and we're putting them on, you know, the same typical course, metformin, and I was always one to advocate insulin because your blood sugars weren't right. You know, why are you putting somebody on prednisone, letting their blood sugar go high, and just say, ah, oh, it's because of the prednisone. I used to love that one. I'm like, do something about it. Treat it. Because the blood sugar isn't saying that. The blood sugar is damaging the body and all the cells. So, so call it, let's, let's give our listeners some golden nuggets so they can take yeah. away a little here. So how often should they be testing their fasted blood glucose? And then what are the values? Like what value are they good? There's nothing to worry about. What value is it? Okay. This is something I, I'm not going to freak out yet, but it's something I want to keep my eye on. And then what value is it basically? Okay. There's, I need to take some mitigation actions right now. Right. Okay. So ideal fasting blood sugar is less than 90. Okay, an ideal in an athlete should be between 75 and 85. When you're running fasting sugars between 100 and 126, that's your cutoff is 126. That is called impaired glucose tolerance. You are beginning the beta cell destruction, and that is the truth. So if that continues for 10 years, we have done epidemiology studies to show that you will get type 2 diabetes, like a, which is, which is Elevated sugars, your fastings are going to be over 130, and you're not going to be able, you're going to have struggle keeping your blood sugars under 180 two hours after eating. So when you're in that 100 to 126 range, we need to get that down, okay? So we need to take intervention. Now, if you're coming up over 126 on two occasions, now let's, for, the, for your client, I want him to, you know, really get enough sleep. Let's stay hydrated. Hydration is another thing. You stim overstimulate yourself and you get your cells dehydrated, your insulin can't work well. So now further, this dehydration that we put ourselves through as athletes, I forgot to mention that, Trevor, we, the more you compete and the more you, and people abuse the shit out of diuretics. Diuretics, if you read on the package insert, cause hyperglycemia, extreme insulin resistance. Let me tell you, when I used to take diuretics, when I, when I help my type ones that have uh, go through a competition, the insulin doesn't work. I would sit there and inject insulin on a diuretic. It's I, at 50, 60 units. It doesn't matter. It doesn't work. When you're dehydrated, your cells do not handle the insulin the same way. So that's a further reason why we're causing this insulin resistance. Okay. So now if you have two fasting sugars over 126, I am concerned. I am concerned. I would go for further testing. Like I would get a C peptide. I would get insulin levels. And I would get a hemoglobin A1C, and that should all be done fasting. And that, and then if you are in that 30-year-old range, type 1 diabetes can happen at absolutely any age. So when I see that the pivotal age, Jason Poston, I hope he doesn't mind me mentioning his name, but I'm sure he won't. I've worked with him, got diabetes in his early, like late 20s, early 30s. It's a perfect age, and I see it mostly in men to get type one diabetes. And I'm not saying that that's the case, but I want to, something interesting about type one is that it can be very fast onset or very 
on a slower scale. So he might have the antibodies. So if you're seeing somebody that's lean in shape, it just doesn't even qualify for somebody that has, you know, that looks like a type two. They actually could have what we call LADA, latent autoimmune diabetes in the adult. And that for sure, you should get your antibodies tested. And just, and their doctors will tell you you're crazy. It's expensive test. I'm not gonna do it, it's a fluke. But I can't tell you how many people I've diagnosed. Like you have no idea. You know, I mean, Jason, for one, I said, Jason, you got to, you know, there's something going on. Get, get your antibodies. Sure enough, he's got the antibodies for type one diabetes. Who would have thought? You know okay. what I mean? So, so if someone's over 126, they mm-hmm. need to go for further testing because they're most likely diabetic. Yeah. If that's- someone's in between 100 and 126, what should they be doing? So that's when, ooh, it's that gray area because like you've seen it, you're on yourself. And I mean, Steve, I mean, you can fix this. I mean, because I mean, you know, we know some intermittent fasting, uh, lowering your carbohydrate intake, getting enough sleep, staying well hydrated, taking some days off. I mean, we you take some days off from the gym? Like, I used to be the worst, you know. Hey, I don't have a pancreas. It doesn't function, right? So I guess I could, you know, I was always figuring it out with insulin. But um, t- you got to take some days off. You've got to get yourself back to a better homeostasis and reducing your stimulants, trying to become stimulant-free, living on your own, like, body's energy, like, Figuring out what that feels like, I mean, it's amazing because I'm like fluid throughout the day, you know, like it's hard to do because it's, you know, it's like you're addicted to that stuff Um, and and watch your fasting. But now, Trevor, what if you do all that? And, you know, and of course, I I, I agree, you and I were speaking about some of the glucose agents that help to dispose of insulin. I mean, I love, I mean, there's a ton of them out there. I mean, there's there's absolutely some science to these um, and they help the cells become more responsive to insulin. I love it. You know, I'm like a big apple cider vinegar person because I, I see it. I don't need as much insulin when I, like, I drink that like three times a day. And uh, it helps the cells become more insulin sensitive. You know, alpha lipoic acid, uh, fenugreek, um, uh, a, uh, vanadium, uh, chromium, colorant. There's a, yeah, yeah, there's a ton of them. There's a, and I'm so into this, you know, this, this is, these are very helpful and it's in the science. But what if you do all that? and it still doesn't do enough or it's not consistent. That's where you have to ask yourself. You can, you can do kind of more radical things in my opinion. I mean, I'm a little more radical on this, but um, because some people can't do the behavior change or they don't want to. And that's, that's the fact of the matter. Like what if I want to compete? I don't really care. <laughs> I mean, people will die for this sport. They will die for this sport. So I have a different theory and it's, it's really radical in some people's mind. And they, I don't know if they think sometimes I'm being irresponsible, but um, before you get into your theory, I got one more yeah. question for you. Metformin. What are your thoughts on metformin? One thing I will say about metformin is that the literature clearly shows that it will mess up your microbiome. So if you are going to use metformin, and I'm not actually anti-metformin, I think it does clear it, you yep. do not want to use it every day. So maybe if you're on like a carb cycling approach, you, you'd only want to use it on your high carb days, maybe only use it on the body parts you're trying to bring up, maybe like two or three times per week, something like that. But if you're going to use metformin, you do not want to use it every day. So Colette, talk to me about metformin and then get into your theory. So metformin is very interesting. It's, it is hard to criticize, right? It's been around since the 80s. It's the tried and true. It is the first line in any diabetologist. I mean, internal medicine to endocrinologists will tell you metformin, metformin, metformin. Uh, they're even giving it to breast cancer patients. because. And I'll, I'll tell you why, though, really. One of the reasons why is we know that glucose does predispose the cells that have, are cancerous to feeding them. Glucose will feed the cells. You know, It feeds cancer cells. So anything that can help the cells dispose of this extra glucose, which metformin does, it helps the cells become more receptive, then it makes sense that, that uh, metformin could have these anti-cancer properties. So metformin has its, its believe me, it's had its place in, 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 bod, in uh, bodybuilding and it's had its absolute place in diabetes on, a, a, really, on, on almost every person that has type 2 diabetes has been on metformin. The problem is though, I always look at these things and, and what, gets me with metformin is, you know, as much as we see all the, the value in it, I mean, you can't disregard what you're saying. The intestinal flora, the B12 deficiency, they have lactic acidosis with it, the GI symptoms that are real that some people literally just can't tolerate. I had a patient the other day and it just tore me up, you know, and they got, then some people will, will kind of deal with it and then it does get better. Like anything else, your body gets used to it. Um, getting used to it doesn't always mean a good thing because then the body's figuring out a way to adapt to it by basically destroying some of the intestinal flora. But, um, so I think that there's a, a 
definite place for it. But then Trevor, I God, dare I say that I'm, I'm just a little different because when you understand what a basal insulin does, they do the same thing. Um, metformin, it stops the hepatic, it lowers the hepatic output of glucose from the liver. That's what it, that's what's main, one of its main functions. It lowers the hepatic output of glucose from the liver, right? And that is exactly, if you read a package insert of a basal insulin, like my, I hate to even, like there's one, Traceba, I guess it's going to come out weird looking on a thing, but Traceba is a basal insulin, in my opinion, one of our best basal insulins we have on the market. It is a 42 hour basal insulin. It is, there is very, very, very low risk of hypoglycemia. I mean, like a point, I, I can get you the, the factors and we'll do that when we put it up. It's extremely hard to overdose on a Traceba. Um, it's so flat and it, you know what it says it does? It lowers the hepatic output of glucose from the liver. Holy, wow. Because it really doesn't lower your blood sugar when you eat. It doesn't, doesn't do it. So then, then Trevor, that's where I go, hmm, interesting. You know, we have two things that almost do the same thing. Which one has the least amount of side effects? Insulin. It's natural. It's a hormone replacement. So I'm always a person that's like, I look for the, the fastest way to get from point A to point B. Metformin's great. But it's going to take you a little bit longer to get to point A and point B. You got to take it every other day. Or you know what I mean? I agree with you. You shouldn't. I mean, you don't want to be on that so often because your body just gets, you know. Or insulin, really, if, if people would get it out of their heads that if you took insulin, insulin's going to cause me to have diabetes. People just don't believe that. People will forever have a fear of insulin because that's what we've been taught. That's what doctors are trying to, like, avoid it. Like, we'll just take as long as we can before we give you insulin. And that, that's slowly changing. It's slowly changing when we start to really understand insulin a bit more and we're not so fearful of one of the major, major, major deathly side effects of insulin, if you watch any insulin commercial is hypoglycemia. And that's when you watch insulin commercials the best. They say, okay, if you have an insulin and the side effects are hypoglycemia, and then you could get dizzy, faint, uh, tingling of the mouth and lips, and then you could die. <laughs> so, I mean, this is why we'll always shy away from using insulin because uh, it, there is a danger. I mean, there's a danger, but there's a lot less risk of danger and hypoglycemia in a long acting insulin than in a short. A short could be lethal. I mean, it's, that's true. Short acting insulin acts so quickly. And if you're not a smart person or in the world of bodybuilding, there a little bit goes, you know, if a little bit's good, then hell, uh, a lot's got to be better. And I promise you that is not the case with insulin. In fact, less is more. You want to take as little insulin as you need to get you the best results. And that's hard to get through somebody's head. There's no need to go more. More isn't gonna help you. You don't wanna feel insulin. You know what I mean? Like, oh, I feel it, I'm feeling tingly. You know, I'm getting like low blood. You don't wanna feel insulin. You want it to do what it needs to do. Take the stress off the beta cell and I get me a fasting sugar between 75 and 85. Please get me that fasting sugar on a consistent basis. You can do that with insulin. Metformin, yes, you can do it. And you can do it with glucose disposing agents and. You can, and you can do it. And that, that's great. And if you do it, that is taking the stress off the beta cell. That's preventing beta cell failure. So you're doing the same thing. Um, it's just a matter of how you want to go about doing it. So Colette, I agree with everything you said. My goal with this video series is to get people actually thinking about their fasting blood glucose, their carbohydrate intake, things like that. I've had really good success if someone is in that 100 to 126 range just by prioritizing their carbs around their workout window um, being a little bit smarter about their stimulant usage, their sleep, their stress. A lot of people have been able to get that, you know, borderline bad range back into the healthy range. But I agree with you. If you're doing all those things, if you're being smart about your carbohydrate intake, if, you know, we all have stress, but if you're managing stress to the right. best of your abilities, if you're, if you're not abusing stimulants, I think a baseline insulin isn't a bad idea at all. Um, and especially, you know, for bodybuilders who require a very large calorie intake and are yep. consuming a lot of carbs, it is beneficial. So in part two of this video series, we're going to go through all the different types of insulins, the half-lives, dosages, things like that. Colette, the last thing to finish off this video series before we get into part two, I want you to talk about the fact that there's no negative feedback loop. Because I think a lot of, I think a big misconception people have is that they're scared that if they use insulin... Yep they're gonna become dependent on it. Kind of like if you abuse steroids, you'll eventually become dependent yeah. on testosterone replacement therapy. Talk to us about the fact that there is no negative feedback loop with insulin, so that's not something you have to be worried about. Right, and, and that is just it. There isn't, it's that the beta cell 
is not a negative feedback loop. It doesn't just die because you're giving it insulin. It, it's actually the opposite. So your body needs to maintain at all costs because believe me, the body knows if it is slightly off in blood glucose, all your counter-regular hormones go to hell, okay? They're all whacked out and the body is in a state of panic and it feels like it's starving. So that's when it starts to kick out more glucose and it's actually working against you. So it's working, it's going to work so hard. It's a work, it's a workhorse cell. This is the beta cell is definitely not involved in any type of negative feedback. In, in fact, what's happening is it's one of these cells that over time just ends up burning out and not able to keep up with the demand of the body. And if you think about what I'm saying, that makes sense because it can't keep up with the demand of the body the heavier you get because there's more cells, there's all these fat cells. It's trying to keep up with the demand, but it can't. So it will do whatever it takes to keep your blood sugar, but really it wants to keep it under 100. That's what the body wants it to do. Okay? That's truly the truth. It really wants to stay under 100. So when that doesn't happen, that cell will just die off and you will lose beta cells. In fact, Type 2 diabetes, once you're diagnosed, every year you lose 5% more beta cells. You're losing them right now, okay? Everybody listening to me. When you give insulin, it actually gives the cell rest. And what we found is that if you can give the cell rest, because it's a workhorse cell, it can actually get stronger. And I know this sounds like hocus pocus, it's not. There are people that are doing this now in, in people in Europe and Japan that are running these studies. So if you actually give insulin earlier in the disease, right? You provide the body insulin, the body will not overproduce insulin, which is what happens in type two diabetes. Now the insulin levels actually come down. So now the absolute opposite of what you think was gonna happen is gonna happen. You're getting more insulin when you're Give it, your body's making more. Then your own body goes, wow, I don't need to make so much more insulin. So the body's, your body's seeing the insulin come in from the outside and then the cell gets to relax and it's not gonna overproduce insulin. It's actually going to then just give a little bit of time to just rebuild itself and get actually stronger. And this is what you can see when people do intermittent fasting and stuff. I had a patient show me their blood work and they, their C-peptide. Okay, you guys, the C-peptide means how much insulin your body makes was very low and actually that's actually not a bad thing it's just showing the beta cell isn't having to work hard and i said what kind of diet are you on he was intermittent fasting he's on a really really low carb diet because he's getting ready for a show and some really stupid doctors go oh my god you could have type 1 diabetes because the, the the c peptide is so low like i have a very low c peptide my c peptide is like in non-existent because i don't make any insulin however this can be the case in people that are eating a low carb diet. They're giving their beta cell rest. Their insulin affinity is really, really high. He's lean, these people are lean, these people are like, their, their bodies are like just motorhouses, you know? So that's actually why I think people that do the calorie restriction diets, they say it's life extension, because you're giving your beta cell rest and it's actually getting stronger. So insulin can give you that same, exactly the same thing, because it's giving the beta cell rest and you're actually extending the life of your beta cell to never, ever see it fail and end up getting type 2 diabetes. And I truly believe this is the case. So what Colette and myself hope to do with part one of this video series is just get people cognizant about fasting blood glucose numbers or carbohydrate intake, things like that. So what we're hoping you're doing is after watching part one, you go buy a blood glucose monitor. They're not that expensive. I mean, with the strips and everything, it's going to cost you maybe 100 bucks. Test your fasting blood glucose. And cheaper than that, Trevor, a Relyon, I don't, I don't know this brand, I'm not, not you know, promoting anything, but Relyon is $10 and you can get 100 strips for $17 from Walmart. You have to buy it online or if you have a Walmart in your area, I live in New York and they don't. That is the absolute cheapest way. It's the same technology in your One Touch or your Bayer Contour and all those. So if you want the, I mean, how cheap is that, Trevor? $10 I don't, for- I don't think we have them in Canada yet. Oh, you may not. You probably don't. My poor Canadians over there. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's okay i got health insurance but, but anyways, yeah. anyways again the the blood glucose monitor you buy doesn't matter just get the cheapest one they're all the yeah. same things all yeah. you're going to get with the more expensive one is going to have some fancy bells and whistles like <laughs> record your fasting blood glucose for you or it'll send you like right. a reminder or something like that like just just get the cheapest one so what we're hoping is after part one you test your fasting blood glucose if you're under 100 you're good 
if you're over 126, go seek medical help because you're most likely diabetic. If you're in between 100 and 126, try prioritizing your carbohydrate intake just around workouts, minimize stress, lower your stimulant usage, reassess in a couple weeks. If you're still in that area, part two of this video series is gonna explain what to do to get further blood work testing, what all these hormones Colette talked about, what they all are, C, PEP, all that sort of stuff, H1C. We're gonna talk about what all those hormones are, what they do, what values you want, and then if you're gonna get into, in, if you're gonna try using a basal insulin, we're gonna talk about all the different types of insulin, dosages to start with, when to take it, it's gonna be all a no brainer. So part one was basically, this is why you should test your fasting blood glucose, go and test it. Part two is basically the mitigation strategy if you're above 100. So thank you for watching and make sure to check out part two.